The Life and Times of Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. So, for whatever reason, most of the Bill Bryson books I tend to read are because somebody else just left them laying around. I guess he, he's that kind of author for me. Somebody I don't actively seek out on my own, but if you toss one of his books my way, I'll happily read it. Uh, this book was the same. Uh, I was over at a friend's house. I was kind of going through his book collection. Uh, he, he had offered to lend some of his books to me. Uh, and I saw the Bill Bryson book and I was thinking about it and he said, ah, I recommend that book. He's like, that book is really funny. He said, it's one of the few books that actually made me laugh out loud while I was reading it. So, I decided to pick it up. Now, if you're not familiar with this book, uh, this book is Bill Bryson's Memoir of the 50s. Uh, kind of intersperses kind of his own childhood reminiscences. Uh, with some commentary on the decade itself. I was born in 1978, so, you know, well after the 50s had ended. But I think, actually, in the late 70s and the 80s, the 50s, or nostalgia for the 50s, uh, was a much bigger part of the culture than it is now. Or, I don't know, I've been living abroad for several years now, so maybe I'm just out of touch. Let me know. Uh, but certainly, nostalgia for the 50s was, was a big thing when I was a kid. You know, old 1950s TV shows were being rerun on TV. Uh, I remember watching Zorro and Davy Crockett on the Disney Channel. And Nickelodeon had this whole thing where they were running shows from the 1950s on Nick at Night. Uh, you had oldies stations on the radio back then, which I, I've been told are now dying out, but were really big back then, which played a lot of songs from the 1950s. Uh, you know, you had the whole Back to the Future movie. You had tons of stuff that was about 1950s nostalgia. Uh, I think I've been told that this is actually what they call the 30 years cycle. Uh, meaning when people get about into their 40s, they become nostalgic for the decade that they grew up in. Uh, so that's why nowadays people are getting really nostalgic for the 80s and Stranger Things and stuff like that. Anyways, all that is a long way of saying I have no memory of the 1950s, um, but the decade does have kind of like a mythical, uh, you know, it's kind of, well, I was growing up in the 80s, the 1950s was looking, looked back on as like this golden age time of American innocence. Um, and also, for that reason, I kind of feel like I have nostalgia for the 1950s, even though I never grew up in them. Um, but anyways, in this book, uh, Bill Bryson takes us through the decade of the 1950s, whether we actually remember it or whether we just kind of feel like we're nostalgic for it anyways. Uh, and there's no better guide than Bill Bryson. I, I haven't read a lot of Bill Bryson, but every time I do read him, I find myself wondering, why don't I read him more? He's a funny guy, and like my friend said, I also found myself laughing out loud several times while reading this book. Uh, and in fact, after finishing this book, I went to Amazon to read some of the other Amazon reviews of this book, and several people commented that they were laughing out loud while they were reading this book. So it's not just me. Uh, in my case, I embarrassed myself in a supermarket uh, well, in the food court in the supermarket, uh, laughing out loud while reading this book, so be forewarned. Now, it's easy to romanticize the 50s as kind of like the last decade when kids were allowed to be kids. Uh, you know, before like television took over everything. Uh, before TV and DVD players and internet and Facebook. Uh, took over everything and kids were actually allowed to go outside. And Bill Bryson actually does kind of write about that in the book. I'll quote, I'll quote directly from the book. <clears throat> Bryson says, the most striking difference between then and now was how many kids there were then. America had 32 million children aged 12 or under in the mid-1950s and four million babies were plopping onto the changing mats every year. So there were kids everywhere, all the time. 
in densities now unimaginable. But especially whenever anything interesting or unusual happened. The other difference from those days was that kids were always outdoors. I knew kids who were pushed out the back door at 8 in the morning and not allowed back in until 5 unless they were on fire or actively bleeding. And they were always looking for something to do. If you stood on any corner with a bike, any corner anywhere, over a hundred children, many of whom you had never seen before, would appear and ask you where you were going. Now, I don't know if this was just me, but I, I thought, boy, what a difference between my childhood. I mean, I remember growing up in the 1980s, people were so worried about strangers. Uh, for, you know, much of my childhood, my mom didn't let me outside the yard unless I was with an adult. Uh, just kind of was always under super supervision. Felt like I barely knew the kids in my neighborhood. Um, yeah, so... That, that struck me as kind of a big difference between the way 1950s were and the way I grew up and the way things were now. However, other parts of the book that are just kind of about childhood in general are pretty timeless. Uh, one thing I really liked was Bryson's description of how time passes when you're a child. And again, I'm, I'm going to read the quote from his book. He says, <clears throat> One of the great myths of life is that childhood passes quickly. In fact, because time moves more slowly in kid world, five times more slowly on a hot afternoon, eight times more slowly on any car journey of over five miles, rising to 86 times more slowly when driving across Nebraska or Pennsylvania lengthwise, and so slowly during the last week before birthdays, Christmases, and summer vacations as to be functionally immeasurable. It goes on for decades when measured in adult terms. It is adult life that is over in a twinkling. Oh man, that is so true. You, you know, like when you're a child, time goes so slowly that it seems like you have all eternity before you. Like, it, you know, it seems like, but it, yeah, it, it seems like it's just going to take an eternity to, to become an, an adult. But then you're an adult and one day you're 20 and then before you know it, you're 40 and you're like, where did that time go, right? Yeah, so I thought that that was really true. Uh, and then there are, all the, there are also many other universal truths of childhood life, no matter what decade you were born in, that are found within the pages, such as Bill Bryson's description of uh, winter clothing, uh, you know, like being bundled all up in the winter clothing and sent to elementary school, and just kind of the chaos at the end of the school day trying to find everyone's mittens and hats and boots. Uh, also, there's a description of trying to use the, the bathroom uh, when you're a kid uh, and you're all bundled up in your winter clothing. And that, that part had me laughing out loud in the middle of the shopping mall when I was reading it. Um, although, I said that was timeless, but I don't know. You know, I guess people say that global warming and everything, I'm not going to get into that. Ne never mind. It's timeless. Uh, but typical of Bryson, and this is typical of the other books I've read, he does kind of mix in a few more serious or political issues with his writing. So along with all the humor in this book, and it is a very funny book, he does manage to have some chapters dealing with the dark sides in the 1950s. Uh, the racism, the anti-communist hysteria, uh, the love of nuclear bombs, uh, the CIA-assisted coup in Guatemala. In all of these, he does an excellent job of retelling and, uh, you know, should be... It, it's good for every American to kind of read this and remember. The coup in Guatemala is especially one of those things that's often forgotten, or at least in my experience, most of the people I've come in contact with have not been told about this, you know, did not learn about it in school, etc. So it's maybe worth 
taking the time to quote at length. And again, I'm going to quote from a section of Bryson's book verbatim. So this is me reading from the book directly. He said, <clears throat> in 1950, Guatemala elected a reformist government. The most democratic Guatemala ever had, according to the historian Howard Zinn. Under Jacobo Arbenz, an educated landowner of good intentions. Arbenz's election was a blow for the American company, United Fruit, which had run Guatemala as a private fiefdom since the 19th century. The company owned nearly everything of importance in the country. The ports, the railways, the communication networks, banks, stores, and some 550,000 acres of farmland. Paid little taxes and could count confidently on the support of a, of a string of repressive dictators. Some 85% of United Fruits land was left more or less permanently idle. This kept fruit prices high, but Guatemalans poor. Arbenz, who was the son of Swiss immigrants and something of an idealist, thought this was unfair, unfair and decided to remake the country along more democratic lines. He established free elections, ended racial discrimination, encouraged a free press, introduced a 40-hour week, legalized unions, and ended government corruption. Needless to say, most people loved him. In an attempt to reduce poverty, he devised a plan to nationalize, at a fair price, much of the idle farmland, including 1,700 acres of his own, and redistribute it in the form of small holdings to 100,000 landless peasants. To that end, Arbenz's government expropriated 400,000 acres of land from United Fruit and offered as compensation the sum the, the sum the company had claimed the land was worth for tax purposes, $1,180,000. United Fruit now decided the land was worth $16 million, actually a sum the Guatemalan government couldn't afford to pay. When Arbenz turned down United Fruit's demand for the higher level of compensation, the company complained to the United, to the United States government, which responded by underwriting a coup. Arbenz fled his homeland in 1954, and a new, more compliant leader named Carlos, Carlos Castillo was installed. To help him on his way, the CIA gave him a list of 70,000 questionable individuals, teachers, doctors, government employees, union organizers, priests, who had supported the reforms in the belief that democracy in Guatemala was a good thing. Thousands of them were never seen again. End quote. So, yeah, <laughs> worth, worth remembering, huh? I mean, not, not good stuff, but stuff that's important to remember. Kind of a downer note to finish the review on, so I'll just re-emphasize what I've said at the beginning. Uh, it does kind of mix the kind of serious stuff with the humorous stuff, but on the whole, a very funny book and definitely worth reading.